So I, I guess yeah, it works not, for not all. an easy thing to do. <laughs> it's for everybody. I mean, you know, CEO, CMO, uh, you know, our, me and my co-founder, we both um, kind of juggle multiple roles right now. But for any sure. C CXO or whatever, or founder, I think being the most productive person out there, how I am like kicked to hear about that. Uh, but uh, Ria, as you as you give us the go ahead, we'll get started. Um, just let us know. We are good to go. All right, super. Okay, so this is we're we're we are live, and it's day two of the D2C growth series here at Mason headquarters. And today we have Serge. Serge is the chief marketing officer at Crossrope, and I'm sure a lot of you have already heard about it. Crossrope's kind of inspiring a bunch of us to have fun while getting fit. Um, uh, and uh, the cool thing about search for me is his writing. Uh, first, there's this analysis of top brands that he does, a breakdown of their, uh, you know, unique e-commerce marketing strategies, very, very exciting stuff on his website. Do check it out. We'll link, link his site um, on the live stream. And uh, second is his writings on how to be an effective CMO. Uh, where he shares his learnings as a marketing head, as well as the number one dad, right? So welcome, Serge, to Mason HQ and today's live stream. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to chat with you guys. Yeah, so we are, we are very excited for the conversation. And we're we going to be talking about the 50x growth in, and the story of Crossroad. But, but before we dive in, we jump in into all that stuff. Just lay out the landscape a bit for us, Serge. Like, what's the shift in consumer demand for health and fitness kind of products over the last couple of years? And now in, in like a post, almost post-pandemic world. It's a great question. I wish I had the, the magic eight <laughs> ball, um, you know, to know where this is all going. Um, but yeah, it's we've definitely seen uh, big changes since over the past two and a half, three years. Um, you know, even before and kind of going into the pandemic, um, there was a, we were seeing a lot more players in the connected fitness space coming in, obviously led by Peloton and, and a lot of the, the lookalikes. Um, so we've never necessarily branded ourselves as a connected uh, fitness solution, but we were definitely within the realm of, you know, a, a fitness solution that, um, that where you don't need necessarily a gym um, or um, or trainers, it's something that you can do on your own. And so when when it all happened um, in 2020, uh, we were well positioned as a great home workout option, you know. And so yeah. we had a pretty crazy 2020. And since then, it's always been the question: like, all right, like what what is uh, when this is all said and done, what is the new normal? And I think we're still. Mm -hmm trying to uh, answer that question um, because like you said, just the, the demand for the different types of health and fitness products and experiences has just changed. We've seen Peloton basically do a full reversal um, mm. as you know, more people are ditching the bike and looking for in-person experiences. We've mm. seen uh, gym um gym memberships and just how many, you know, uh, the volume of people going back into sort of in-person, um, well, gyms and studios is just basically returned to pre-pandemic levels, if not higher, as people have been just yeah. craving that in-person uh, part. And so it's always been a question, like how much of what's happened in 2020 and 2021 is going to remain um, going forward and how much is going to go back um, to the, to the way it was. And I feel, yeah. you know, I feel like we've basically done a full reversal where we're like basically at pre pandemic levels in terms of uh, consumer demand for home workout solutions. Um, so it's been an interesting journey for us to figure out where, where, but in terms of like where it's going over the next couple of years, I, I do still think that, um, at home, portable, connected, even fitness uh, experiences, digital fitness experiences have a place just like remote work has a place. There's, there's yeah. a hybrid, uh, a hybrid mode that I think people will crave. Um, part of it is just wanting and, and, and needing a, a fitness solution and experience of it that's convenient to do at, you know, within their busy schedules. Um, and then part of it is just the craving to 
be surrounded by others. Um, so I think it'll end up being some sort of hybrid mode where exactly it's all going to land. I, I wish I knew. Yeah, yeah. And and honestly speaking, this is expected, right? This is like the rebound phase. Uh, uh, all yeah. of us definitely want to get out there and get like more of the energy around us rather than being holed up in our houses. And we've done that for a while. Uh, but just looking at my own lifestyle, uh, you know, as someone who uh, is a lot digitally, uh, you know, um, uh, digital nomad, a large part of my uh, usual year, non-pandemic years. And uh, I mean, you can't run away from the fact that you need a balance of both. It's not always that you crave, uh, you know, working with, working out with people or always that you want to be at home and just work out alone. So definitely there's a hybrid, I guess, is the way ahead for most of, uh, you know, uh, domains and functions and industries in the coming years. For sure. And I think just the last point is that I think what's happened over the past two plus years is, has shown people that you actually can get a really good yeah. workout yeah. at home if you've got the right tools um, and the right guidance. Right. And that's uh, what's allowed us to position ourselves, you know, as in, in that space over that time is, you know, we, we have a, a great jump rope system that people love. Um, yeah. And we've really leaned into the content side of things, um, you know, that can, people can just open up the app, uh, filter workouts based on how much time they have or what ropes they have, and literally just pick one and follow along. So, you know, I think, a, you know, a lot of these at home solutions have just gotten so much better, so much more engaging, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, people have figured out that you can actually get a great workout at home. Just again, I, I love the parallel of the work from home thing. Like as people have yeah. also discovered that they can actually work from home effectively, it's the same sort of thing. But you're right, yeah. there's the middle ground that we, we're gonna land in somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I wanna double click on uh, you know, the app strategy a little bit, but before that, uh, for, for our audience, let's rewind back uh, in, into the early days of Crossrope. And um, how big was it when you, when you joined and what were some of these early initial challenges for growth at Crossrope when you joined? Yeah, um, well, Crossrope was founded uh, by my friend and CEO, Dave Hunt. He's a former Navy pilot. He was stationed all over the world. Um, and he was always looking and he was a former athlete, collegiate high jumper. Um, uh, and he was looking for a fitness solution, um, that could, he could do sort of while he's stationed out on the desert with no equipment around him. And he kind of came across these jump ropes and then weighted jump ropes, but they were just terribly designed. And so he kind of came up with this novel solution where you can, uh, get a, a larger variety of weighted ropes that you can clip in and out of your handles. Um, and so you can get a really effective full body workout once you start introducing weighted ropes into the mix. It's very different than just a regular jump rope. And then I joined in um, around a couple of years after that. So he was still building this on the side while, um, while he was in the Navy and I joined him and we sort of just partnered up. Um, and since 2015, it was basically just two of us and maybe an, an admin here and there um to i think at our peak we were at 35 ish people um over the last seven years i guess um mm -hmm. and so yeah it's been it's been a quite quite a journey um in terms of challenges um i think um there's plenty but i think one of the biggest challenges in the early days was you know, the, the education involved around weighted jump ropes. So, yeah. you know, when I, when, the, when I tell somebody, you know, what we offer, which is a weighted jump rope solution, most people are like, well, well what is that? You know, I know yeah. what a jump rope is. Oh, is it like the weight in the handles or like, what's the point of having the weight in the ropes, et cetera. So there's a lot of questioning um, versus like, you know, if I was selling a, a, a pair of socks with the new design on it. Like there's no questioning. People know what socks are. So, you know, it's from the very early days, it, there's just been a lot of education involved um, mm. in terms of explaining what the cross rope workout experience really is and what it's like to use weighted jump ropes. And the best sort of uh, example of that is when we would go to trade shows, especially in the mm. early days. 
and we'd have we went to the arnold classics like two hundred thousand people walking around all like big buff guys and everyone's like oh that looks pretty easy Mm -hmm. and then we were running this challenge we called our one pound intensity challenge because at that time that was the name of the rope um it's a one pound rope all the weights in the rope not the handles and when you're pulling your where basically when you're turning this around your body at full speed it is a workout to try to control this thing And so you could see it instantly on the faces of every single person who does the workout um, that they're realizing, okay, this is what it's about. Like this is, you know, they, they understand it once they try it. And that's always like how, how we do that digitally, you know, and how we sort of explain that through our marketing channels and our marketing messaging and imagery and and everything. Um, That's always been like, uh, challenges, but especially up front. Now it's a little bit easier because we've got a large customer base, a big community, and we rely on them to express what Crossrope is. And it's it's more believable and understandable when it comes from the horse's mouth in a sense. So, yeah. uh, but in the early days, uh, that was one of the challenges um, amongst others for sure. Got it. And, and so, I mean, category creation is hard. Like, like no matter what kind of category you're creating, it's a hard job. And uh, uh, which means that a lot of, as you said, education-led approach, it's, it's the same for SaaS or brands. It, it, I think it, it's so, such a unique uh, position to be at. And education, customer education becomes super important. Uh, but of course, that means a lot of iteration on, as you said, like the story itself, like what sort of visuals do you use? How do you amplify it with like maybe how-to videos and, you know, customer testimonials, et cetera. And, getting testimonials in the early days too right like case studies and yeah. stuff and so so uh, of course like as you're experimenting on all of that uh, did you did you think about or did you actually have a kind of like a attribution funnel set up in the from day one you know marketing automation all of that happening from day one or was that as you experimented and kind of found a bit more of a voice and tone and then uh, you know all of that systems uh, started taking shape yeah, the systems definitely came, you know, later. And initially, mm-hmm. it was a lot of just testing, experimenting. And uh, I'm glad you brought up the category creation piece because that's ultimately what it was. You know, yeah. jump ropes have been around forever, um, but nobody's really focused in on the fitness aspect of jump ropes. You know, it was either used by professional athletes um, or it was used by kids on the playground. There's almost like nothing in between for the mass market of people who are looking for a great, you know, uh, great workout experience, you know, whether they're focusing on cardio or something else. So for us, early on, we really decided like, hey, let's let's focus in and build out this jump rope fitness category, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's what we wanted to be known for and what to focus on and, and, and put all our time, effort and energy into building positioning ourselves as the leaders of that so um part of the success you know that we had in the early days um was really around these um i I guess they were called challenges at the time we would do these Mm. free 30-day fitness challenges right and it what it allowed us to do is you know obviously build brand awareness through through free and valuable content Um, But it also gave us that platform where we could educate and bring people together um, around a around this, you know, unique and um, an engaging event. Right. And so we created a ton of content, 30 days of workouts and nutrition guides. And, you know, this was uh, the the good days of Facebook when I could bring in, you know, uh, people into the challenge and promote that thing like crazy, helped Mm -hmm. us build a, a massive Facebook group you know, where we could bring people together to do the challenges and workouts alongside each other from all around the world. So all that, I mean, it was very content and value-based. And then the, the, the cross rope was just there as the mechan- uh, sort of like the, the mechanism and the tool that you didn't have mm. to use if you didn't want to. But once you join the community and you see others using the ropes and you kind of hear them talking about it and they're doing the workouts the the ways they're they're designed eventually you know you're like all right i gotta try this thing right Mm -hmm. um so it was those challenges in the early days in the sort of building the community around them um that helped sort of gain a little bit of traction and and offset some of that and work through some of those content-based challenges or education-based challenges i should say that's very interesting and 
uh, I mean, community building itself is still hard. Uh, again, anything category building is hard. And even if you're not building a com uh, category, community building is hard. So uh, I like what you mentioned, Serge, is that the community was around the challenge and the challenge of getting fit versus about using this to get fit, mm -hmm. right? And, and a lot of times we tend to forget that people um, are, it's about the problem. It's not about like use this to kind of solve that, right? Uh, uh, was there something that, what were some of the things that didn't work out when you were building the community? Because it's it's always a hit and miss. It is always a lot of experimentation. I'm sure it's locked up in your head. Uh, so would love to double click on that. You know, community worked out, the 30 day challenge worked, but what were some iterations of the 30 day challenge maybe that did not work? And then what was the version that worked? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of what didn't work, I think, um, may or may not answer the question directly. I think in the early days, and you see this even now with brands, it's like deciding like, all right, so if I want to have this Facebook group where I bring people, do we build one around just our customers? You know, mm -hmm. and that's sort of a value add where you can meet other customers. You'll see this a lot in VIP Facebook groups for a lot of brands where they'll bring customers in. And there's some value in that where you can enroll your customers or now your quote unquote community members um, into you know, maybe the, the decision-making around new products or giving them exposure to new launches early, all that sort of stuff. For us, you know, it never felt like the right move. I think for me, kind of in line with what you're saying around community, it's not about the product. It's people coming together around a common interest or a common uh, problem that they're trying to solve. And the solution, there, there are many, right? At the end of the day, when we survey people, like 60% of them are purchasing a crossroad set because they're looking to lose weight, right? There's, I can give you a hundred different ways you can go about trying to lose weight, right? So I think it's just a community for us. I think it's not a mishap we made. I think it was a, just, that was a decision-making part. It's also, you know, do we stay on Facebook? Or do we get off platform and kind of yeah. own our own thing? And, you know, um, we, we decided to stay on there because we wanted to minimize the friction points for new, new people to, to join, right? They're already on the platform. Now it's just a one click away where you can meet all these people. So um, we've tried a bunch of, you know, in terms of what didn't work, you know, we tried different variations of challenges. Eventually after you run quite a number of challenges, they, they kind of like start getting a little repetitive. So, you know, mm -hmm. requires some iterating and trying, uh, how do we make them more engaging and compelling? How do we, um, how do we cater to both existing members who've been around for a year and those who just brand new, completely different subset of people. So yep. we made a bunch of mistakes as we've sort of worked through those challenges. And, you know, it's, it's never easy uh, to cater to a hundred thousand people who are of all different fitness levels and um, you know, ages and experiences with jumping rope, et cetera. So you just try to do the best you can. Yeah. Yeah. What, what would you do differently now? Uh, uh, you know, because I've been tripping over jump rope videos for a bit now, I, even with, even before we, we connected and we met, uh, uh, you know, there is all these cool videos on YouTube or TikTok where, you know, people are kind of doing all these amazing uh, things with jump ropes. And I was like, when can I ever get there? <laughs> right? So you were like kind of scrolling and binging on that. But like, I would assume that today, if someone has to kind of do a community or something of that sort around this, um, you might think of like, how do I leverage TikTok or YouTube or something of that sort? So what would you, if you just step back and think, um, someone is starting in the fitness um, you know, industry today with a new equipment or an upgraded version of an equipment, let's say a kettle, kettle ball for a uh, kettlebell for a uh, lack of any other example. What would you ask them or give them as advice to do differently while building, building the community? Yeah, I mean, the ecosystem is a little bit different now in terms of even, let's say, building out a Facebook group. It's not like it was back in 2016, 2017. Yeah. It's definitely a lot more difficult to build. But I mean, platform aside, like we're just thinking agnostically, um, there's to me, I think uh, there's not really much I would do differently outside of like lean harder into it. You know, I think hmm. uh, there's... I think there's this like misconception you hear a lot of you know, communities sort of like that 
one of those buzzwords just thrown around. And for yeah. most brands, when they say community, they're just referring to their customer base, which I think is not the true definition of a community. I think going back to that definition of, of the community, I think it's really understanding uh, what problem it is that you're solving and how, what gap you're filling in, a, in your customer's life and what the commonalities in, are amongst your, 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 your customers, right? Let's say your people, right? It doesn't even have to be customers. Like people, there are a lot of people in our, in our Facebook group that are, don't, are not cross rope customers, but they're, they love to jump rope. They love to stay fit. These are our people, you know, whether they want to use the product or not. So for me, I think it's, you know, looking for opportunities, whether it's in Facebook or in Discord or whatever the platform of the, of, of the day is that works for you. How do you bring people together um, and sort of let them just participate and share and give them value up front, you know, in relation to this commonality that you found? So for us, it was challenges, right? It, it could be you know, if you're a makeup brand, it could be, you know, tons of like tutorials and you're bringing in, you know, speakers or, you know, professionals or you're basically, it's, it's all around this one problem, but you're bringing people together somewhere where they can communicate, where they can, you know, learn. Um, but it's, again, it's all around sort of like the, the, the common problem. And again, not about the product. You're just there yeah. facilitating and, you know, being a host. So to me, it's like, you know, there's a lot, a lot of different ways that can manifest, but um, it's more than just about, hey, let's just bring our customers together. So changing gears a little bit from the early days, right? Um, I mean, you, you grew the community to a certain level and you're starting to see it actually translate into actual, you know, your revenue and your orders as a business. Um, and, and what were these next set of channels that you started layering on, right? Like, was it paid? Was it marketplaces like Amazon? How did you think about that? Yeah. Um, so in the early days, it was these challenges. And then in parallel, we sort of built out our email flows, you know, yeah. uh, so to join a challenge, basically, you have to sign up like you would expect uh, on a mm -hmm. landing page. Once you sign up, you get directed to the Facebook group. We introduce you to the product. So in those early days, it was those, all those uh, initiatives were around building our email list, uh, mm -hmm. building our building up our Facebook group, and then positioning Crossrope as sort of like a tool. So that you know uh, that was an effective solution for us at that time. From there, I mean, we started sort of opening up our and most of our Facebook advertising was revolving around this challenge. We didn't do much okay. else, and then we sort of started building on top of that. Okay, let's get some, you know, prospecting, retargeting, your usual mix of ads. You know, we got into like PPC and display very early on. We also got into like the content, like SEO game really early on. So that was mm -hmm. something um, I was always like really big into content marketing uh, before Crossrope. And so I kind of said like, all right, there's, I want to own every single jump rope related keyword, you know, anybody mm. searching for any, anything jump rope related, I want to be, I want to be there. And so we built out a quite a bit of content and now that's since day one, that's kind of been our biggest traffic driving channel, but it's definitely mm. more on the educational front. Um, so we focused in on the, on the SEO side of things. And then from, you know, year over year, you know, we built out an affiliate program, found some really great affiliate mm. partners to work with. You know, we experimented and started working with influencers later in the game. Um, you know, we started YouTube advertising and just been sort of tinkering and playing around with that. You know, in 2020, when we, you know, when things went a little crazy, we opened up to all sorts of channels. Um, mm -hmm. It was a little bit of a crazy period. I can't say we learned a ton because everything just, whatever you did, it just worked during that time because the message was so crystal clear and resonated with everybody during that time that we didn't actually get a lot of learnings, unfortunately. Um, yeah. But it was cool experience to be able to test out podcasting and sponsored newsletters. And uh, we got into the SMS game. So it's been a gradual buildup of the marketing mix. And some of them we've kept and some of them we've you know, uh, we've, we've stopped using, um, but yeah, it wasn't definitely all from the outset and it was a gradual buildup. 
And your orders actually come from your direct, your D2C presence versus marketplaces or versus social? Like, is it is it directly buy, buyable from Facebook or Instagram? Or, or is it like people are routed to your D2C presence? Yeah, we try to run everything through our, through our Shopify site. We do have an Amazon presence. Um, hmm. We mostly think of that as just serving customers who only shop on Amazon, um, hmm. not necessarily as a as a discovery play, although some mm. customers do find us. Um, so yeah, I mean, most of our efforts are driven are, are about driving people to our, to our Shopify site. Got it. And, and then in your Shopify, like your strategy within the site also becomes important. So are you leveraging things like subscriptions or kind of like getting AOVs up or bundling in certain ways or whatever else, or any, any kind of value added, uh, you know, services that you're adding as a part of the, how, how are you looking at, your in-store funnel uh, in, from a marketing perspective, marketing and growth perspective? Yeah, 100%, we're doing all of that. Um, I'd say what's interesting is those challenges ended up sort of sparking this idea where it's like, okay, people love the challenges, they love the content, mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's turn that into an app. And so we built mm -hmm. an app back in like 2016 or 2017, it was like, a really rudimentary like app, you know, we had like 40 workouts hard coded for like a year, you know, nothing changed, yeah. but people loved it. People loved those 40 workouts. Uh, but it was, you know, it was our transition into the content side of things. Um, how do we go from delivering PDFs to creating a more engaging work workout mm. experience where they can follow along and choose a workout from their app. And then, once we saw some traction there, we went all in on the app. And I mean, now it's, you know, it's a super highly rated app within both ecosystems, you know. Um, and what it's allowed us to do is offer a subscription component to the business yeah. where, yes, you can download the app. There's a ton of free stuff that you can access, workouts, features, et cetera. But we've also got a ton of premium workouts and premium features uh, that you can yeah. unlock with like a relatively inexpensive annual subscription. So for us, that's a big, uh, big development over the past couple of years is adding mm -hmm. that um, to the mix. And obviously it's done uh, and, and it uh, will do a lot of great things for our lifetime value. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a very smart thing that you got into at the right time. Uh, we are uh, at, at kind of like the 30 minute, minute mark. So I just want to make sure we also have the audience questions in. But before that, uh, you know, one thing that I noticed, uh, Serge, is I mean, about 20,000 five-star reviews on your, it's incredible, right? So NPS, whatever, review, review referrals, how did, it, how was it in the early days? How has it evolved? How do you leverage that today um, uh, to kind of grow, continue to grow and continue to increase your uh, presence? Yeah, I mean, we've been very big on the customer feedback from the early days. To answer like the 20,000 five-star reviews, that's, mm. you just got to have a great product. Like, yeah. you know, it's um, Dave and the whole like product development team, they've just done a fantastic job building out of like, we're both engineers. Every, the product is re-engineered and redesigned every couple of years to like the smallest detail. So we're very focused on that and, uh, we're, we're all into fitness. So we know what, you know, with the experience we want. And so we're able to build that into a great product and it's reflected in those reviews. The NPS, I mean, I could spend another 30 minutes on, uh, but it's, it's a fantastic tool. More brands should use it. You know, you can really learn, start to understand, you know, I'll share two quick things. One, it's a, you'll get a lot of great uh, copy and messaging ideas because similar to test, yeah. similar to the reviews you'd get, but it's answered a little bit differently. So we get a lot of stories out of it, you know, and that we then just literally copy and paste with permission to use for ads. And, you know, it's, it works really well. More importantly though, the passives, these are like the people who said, answered the question of how likely they're recommended to friends as a seven or eight, um, these are the people who had a good experience, but not good enough to share with their friends. And what you want to do is really dive into those and understand where the miss was. It's kind of like mm -hmm. reading three and four star Amazon reviews. 
It was yeah. good, but not great. And you want to know where that gap was. And I think there's a lot of gold nuggets that you can pull from that, whether it's, you know, following up with the customers or just trying to at least spot patterns uh, for what they're saying. And then you've got your detractors and ultimately the score itself is a great proxy for your customer uh, experience that you're delivering, especially if that's a key focus for you, like it is for us. Yeah. yeah, and, mean, and go, on. yeah. go on, go on, please. I was going to say, I could, I could go on all day about NPS. I, <laughs> I think it's, you know, um, it's, a, it's a great tool, but I think, you know, that, that should sum up at least where I think the, the value is for the most part. I do have a couple of double clicks on that though. Uh, in, in one of our previous live stream events, actually, uh, uh, you know, one of uh, uh, an expert, uh, a conversion rate optimization expert who specializes in, you know, utilizing, analyzing, reusing uh, customer testimonials and reviews to kind of increase conversions within your store funnel, within your shopping funnel, et cetera. He mentioned something very interesting about how do you mine reviews to actually recategorize your product lines? In your case, I, I assume that would apply more to, uh, you know, your fitness regimes, et cetera, versus the product itself. Um, uh, uh, but could be like, why are you looking for, uh, in the example that he gave was around Casper. And, uh, you know, when you're searching for mattresses, everybody has different problems. It's not just like I'm searching for a mattress or a king size bed. It's like, hey, I got, I got like lower back pain or someone's like, I sleep very, light and so i need something that kind of like you know numbs out noises or whatever right so uh, i need something with better springs and um so so getting those mining out those nuggets from the reviews and then they actually recategorize uh you know their nav navs navigation within uh their app and their their store and they found really you know, a uh, big impact on conversions, direct conversions too, because now people are able to search for the problems that they need faster. And, and so as you were talking about like mining reviews and, you know, mentioning how you can verbatim get so much of information from your, uh, the reviews or the NPS itself, it was coming, it was just crossing my mind. This thought came up uh, uh, in my mind. Have you, have you run uh, any experiments of that sort? Have you looked at it from that direction? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the exact same thing. I think that's really smart, you know, but ultimately it's how do you listen to the, your customers um, mm. and, and, and make the necessary improvements. So whether it's product specific or experience specific, but, mm. you know, um, for us, it's, uh, it, it has really been a, a gold mine. And I think the, the framing of the question is different and interesting yeah. relative to reviews because, you're asking customers how likely are they to recommend it to their friends? Not mm -hmm. necessarily, hey, how did you like this product? They're two different yeah. questions, right? And yeah. so what it's for us for, as a, an example, right? And I think this is like maybe some just part of the, our, our pricing or like our pricing challenges. It's an expensive product relative to a basic jump rope, an inexpensive product relative to some other fitness solutions. You know, and so we'll get a lot of, interesting NPS comments where it's like, Hey, I really love this product. It was so amazing, but I just can't recommend it to my friends because of the price. Right. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's not something you would necessarily hear or get from a product review. Right. Yeah. Um, here's somebody who had an, an amazing experience with the product, but at the framing with the price is making it difficult. So for us, when we're thinking about our referral program, when we're thinking about our how we're structuring our post-purchase emails, how we want to incentivize and encourage sharing with friends. You know, we that that is something that, you know, we have to think about and we work our way around where it's like, hey, let your friends know that you can, that you can get your uh, their cross rope set with four interest-free payments, you know, maybe lean into the financing aspect. You know, mm. but you can come up with all sorts of solutions now for how to help them share it with their friends in a way that doesn't, make them feel uncomfortable sharing uh, a, an expensive jump rope product, for instance, right? It's all about framing. So that's just an example of like the types of insights you might get that you might not get from a product review um, that you can then leverage and hopefully improve and increase uh, your repeat purchase rate, which is going to do wonders for, you know, again, your, um, not sorry, not your repeat purchase rate, although it could, but at least your referral uh, right yeah. within your referral program or just, you know, uh, cut back on your acquisition costs. Yeah, this, this is a great example. Thank you. It really, really helps a lot. Um, I want to quickly dive into the 
uh, questions. I'm going to go sure. bottom up. Um, uh, so uh, Soumya asked, how do you use v visual cues on your store uh, to show first time visitors the effectiveness of weighted jump ropes? Great question, especially for us, because again, going back to that initial challenge of education, um, nobody knows what a weighted jump rope is. Um, mm -hmm. So we do, we've invested quite a bit on like the visuals and how do we actually demonstrate that? So um, two things I'll share. One, um, we sort of created this interactive graphic um, one thing we really wanted to show people is how many, how much more, uh, how many more muscles you engage when using a weighted rope versus a regular rope. So it's not even education around cross rope specifically. It's education around uh, weighted jump ropes versus basic jump ropes because people just mm -hmm. don't know what that means. And so it's a little cool slider thing that when you shift to the light rope side, it shows you, yeah. you know, kind of like in a heat map style. Hey, you're, you're only engaging you're engaging like five to 10 muscles in, in a light fashion. When you moved all the way to the heavy side, now you're engaging all these extra muscles at a much higher intensity. So it's a kind of like a cool visual, uh, a cool way, instead of just saying it's like, hey, engage just more muscle groups, right? Yeah, yeah. Another one that is a little bit, you know, that, that's more specific to us, but one that I'd recommend experimenting with is there's a tool we started using recently called VideoWise. Um, and it's, uh, it allows you basically to show short form vertical videos, this type of stuff you'd see on TikTok and reels and et cetera, that people are yeah. more familiar with watching and you can upload and, or choose something from your feed. So it's kind of like, a, it's, it's a much more engaging, uh, see it in action type of, uh, asset. And we use that. We started implementing those on our product pages. So we have one quick video of somebody showing like unboxing and what they're taking out. So it helps customers and shoppers visualize what they're actually going to be getting in the box. We got somebody scrolling through the app feed to show the content. We got another one actually using the half pound weighted rope to show it. And so I think that's uh, those are the ways for us that we're able to show people outside of just images. Images, it's really difficult to explain what cross rope is through images so for us it's just these interactive gifs and videos that just you know have have, have worked really well and we we keep hearing it you know we hope here yeah. from customers oh, i love that graphic that you guys have on the home page yeah. you know so we, we've been getting feedback that it's it's doing its job so are you also leveraging ugc in in that or like for example these yes. videos yeah yeah okay all that video wise content is ugc content Got it. So do they get, do like your, someone who buys it or rates you or gives you an NPS survey, you know, drops a survey, do you ask them for like a video drop? Is that how? Um, sometimes, but we have, we source UGC from all, all sorts of places, um, whether it's from existing customers or some of our creative, creative partners or yeah. um, our affiliates, Etc. So I don't know exactly where we go. Some of them are from internally. Like if we've got our, we have uh, two cross rope athletes in house. Sometimes yeah. they, they create a lot of content for us. But yeah. again, it's it's really not. It's it's really just about showcasing it in real life. Uh, less yeah. about who's who's creating it. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. All right, over to the next question. What has been some of your what what have been some of your strategies to push membership first approach? And how are your users responding to it from Ash? Okay. Yeah, if the question is around sort of um, membership, because our, our app subscription, we call it our all access membership. Um, yeah. In terms of, if it's related to that in terms of strategies. I guess. To push that, um, yeah, that, that, I mean, that is a, has been a, a challenging um, problem to solve um, mm. for, for many different reasons, but and so we've tried and tested a lot of different things um, in terms of how to how we're positioning the the membership. Again, um, the solution always comes back to education. The higher mm. up you can go in the funnel for us to showcase that there's a content element to the crossroad experience, because most people will get to the product page. 
and I have no idea that there's actually an app. So by the time yeah. we see the option to, to add that to their order, I have no idea what mm. it is. So mm. the solution, and you've got to work your way up the funnel and educate. And so a lot of our assets, you know, our ads, UGC ads, branded ads, they're showing the app and the content as part of this overall experience and not just the ropes, right? Yeah. So that's part of, that's been part of the, in terms of the how, um, showcase what the membership is. And so if it's more related to the community, like our Facebook group, then it's just like, you know, wherever it makes sense, drive, direct people there. They make a mm-hmm. purchase, Thanks for your purchase. Hey, make sure to join our, our private Facebook group. You'll meet hundreds of other, hundreds of thousands of other jumpers from around the world. You can, you know, uh, share learnings with, ask questions, et cetera. If they become, if they join your welcome flow and there's a list there, like drive on them. We know if we can bring people into the Facebook group, eventually one of the other members who's using a crosser will convince them, you know? Yeah. So hopefully that answers it. Yeah, yeah, no, that definitely answers for me. Um, and, and I'll just take one last question. Uh, yeah. How do you see online communities and personal fitness come together? Uh, Barada Asit uh, is asking that question. I think we've covered it in a bit, uh, in some way, but. How do we see online communities and personal fitness uh, come together? Um... Now that everybody is going back out and yeah. trying to rebounding from, from the pandemic. Yeah, for sure. I, again, I think uh, there's definitely that, that hybrid approach. I mean, we're social creatures. So there's definitely, whether you're, you know, um, working out in a studio or you're working out at home with people on your screen, like through a Peloton or like people are just, it, not only do you crave that, but it's also, much more effective way to get a workout and not a, you know, there's motivation involved, you know, there's a level of accountability. So there's definitely a lot of value uh, in all, even whether it's in person or online communities and like fitness goals, as we've all probably experienced achieving fitness goals is not an easy thing to do, uh, especially when you're one month in and all the motivation yeah. from that initial excitement phase is gone. So I think um, in terms of like how they come together, What's cool about the last couple of years is the technology has just evolved. We went from like March, 2020 with scrapping together Zoom workouts, right? To, you know, some really great apps coming out and some some new platforms coming out for trainers and to basically share their learnings and educate. And you got all these now connected fitness experiences that just have amazing solutions from, you know, and it's all obviously some personal preference, but, you know, whether you're on a mirror right? Uh, and you're speaking directly uh, with your trainer and he's guiding you right through that piece of technology. That's it's amazing. If you're looking for something a little bit, you can take on the road and you've got your, um, you know, you, you just don't want to do your workouts there. Now you've got to, you can get your cross rope set and within, within the app, you've got people you can communicate with, uh, content that can guide you. So I think in terms of how they come together, I feel like it's already come together it's just um just because of how far we've come with the tech and and people's um i think the desire for stuff for solutions like that like i don't know about you i got two kids um i don't have time always to go to the gym um but i do have 20 minutes to go in the backyard and and select a workout for my app um you know crush the workout share my results with my friends check it off on my things to do and I'm done and I have to leave the home. So it's, it's going to, uh, I think, uh, I, I, but with that, I still crave community and I share that with my own friends, my own community. Um, and I'll jump into the Facebook group and sometimes and share that. So it's going to depend, but I feel like it's already come together and brands yeah. I think are realizing, um, that that's what, that's what people want. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Serge. It's been, uh, I've, I've taken way over uh, our promised time, but it was super interesting. It just shows that I was, we were really engaged and uh, had a ton of learning. For me, top three things that stood out, one category building is a lot about educating and uh, how do you, you know, the different ways people think of just pure play content, but in your case, and I found that really exciting is how do you, did you leverage challenges and not necessarily just challenges to use your uh, product, but 
just challenging the lifestyle uh, of getting uh, a lifestyle aspect of getting fit and bringing people together uh, to educate uh, about that and hence educating about the product right so um, I, I thought that was one thing that really stood out for me the second is uh, uh, you know finding different ways of monetization so you know the product is not just the jump rope uh, or the weighted rope because what do I do with it so how you're leveraging content in the subscription uh, to uh, you know specific premium content and premium uh, uh, you know um, uh, fitness regimes to actually bring together not just the product but also what do you do with the product together and add more uh, you know uh, value to you as a business right so I found that second super interesting and uh, the third uh, is uh, just how. Uh, you know, uh, even though it's community centric, how the definition of community centric can really change based on environment factors, uh, like pre pandemic, during pandemic, now again, and uh, in this kind of like a hybrid, we're still figuring out world. And I really found that very exciting, very interesting that hey, it doesn't matter, uh, uh, you know, your core framework and a core construct can remain the same, but how you got to utilize it and leverage it at different points in time and you're so flexible about it um, uh, and, and you're constantly relooking and reinventing. I found that super, super exciting. So thank you so much for all these learnings. We'll definitely try to bring you on again and uh, we'll catch up soon over a cup of coffee and uh, thank you again. Thanks. Thanks to our audience for all the questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really nice to chat. And uh, if anybody has any follow-up questions, just feel free to find me on LinkedIn yes. and i um, happy to chat always. Yeah, we'll be dropping in. Uh, we'll drop it. We'll be dropping in Serge's uh, uh, website details where you can find all the awesome content that he writes about, and you can also find a way to reach him. All right, thank, thank you, you so much. That was a lot of fun. Have a great day. Yeah, you too.